Welcome to the Lease Options Introduction Lesson. This lesson is designed to help you get a deeper understanding of another excellent way to obtain and make money from real estate. By now, on your journey to success, you should know that your four main target areas are have a functional understanding of the common terms and techniques used in real estate, as well as achieved an understanding of how to find, evaluate, and make offers on properties. Now, one of the biggest things you need to have in mind when evaluating properties is your plan for entering and exiting the property. This lesson will focus on a rather lucrative way to both enter and exit a property. The strategy we will discuss is called lease options. Before starting this lesson, it will be to your benefit to make sure you have a functioning knowledge of the following items. It's important at this point to have a good grasp of the basic principles and terminology used in real estate investing. Keep in mind that if you come across a term in this lesson that you don't understand, you can use the glossary to look it up. You should understand generally what properties to look for and why. Now, the specific property criteria may change a little depending upon what strategy you're using. But understanding generally what makes a good investment property is important. Along with knowing what to look for is, how and where to look for it. Again, you should have a basic understanding of where you want to invest, as well as some ideas for how you're going to find motivated sellers. Another important thing for you to know is how to do income property analysis. Running numbers on a property is one of the surest ways to know if you can make money on it. And with lease options, you may need to run numbers to both enter and exit the deal. Finally, you should know the basics of the three main investment strategies. As a reminder, those strategies are investing for cash, the longer term buy and hold strategy, as well as a buy, fix, and sell approach. It is important to understand these since lease options, as well as some of the techniques taught in the next few lessons, build upon the basic ideas taught in those three main techniques. If you need to review any of the items included here, please go back through the Real Estate Basics course. Allow me to welcome you to the lesson as well. We're going to cover some interesting information in this one, so I hope you're ready to learn. Speaking of learning, here are just some of the main points Janet and I will cover in this lesson. First, you will learn what lease options are. You may already be familiar with them, but Janet and I will give you a thorough understanding of what they are and how they work best for investing. Second, you will leave this lesson being able to identify the pros and cons of using lease options to build wealth through real estate investing. Obviously, lease options aren't for everyone, so these pros and cons will help you evaluate if they are a good technique for you to employ. Third, you will learn what constitutes an ideal seller and buyer for lease options. Just like the technique may not be right for every investor, there are some sellers and buyers that are not quite right for lease options. Knowing who you are looking for will greatly reduce the time it takes to sift through these circles of who just won't fit into your square, thus saving you time and money. You will also learn what makes an ideal lease option property. Now you may be thinking that an ideal property is simply one you can get control of, but that is not necessarily true. Some properties are better for lease optioning than others. Another very important thing you will learn in this lesson is what clauses to use in your lease and option agreements. But not only will you learn what to put in the agreements, you will also learn why to use two separate ones to further protect your profit. Finally, through this lesson, you will learn how to best market for lease options. That is to say, how to find these ideal sellers, tenant buyers, and the properties themselves. So by the end of the lesson, you will have all the knowledge and tools necessary to be a money-making, lease optioning machine, if you so choose. So with nothing further, let's really get started with Janet providing our tips for success. Thanks, Bob. The tips for success for this lesson are designed to make being successful with lease options even easier. So to that end, our first tip is to make sure and include everything in writing. You want to ensure that all parties involved in the transaction understand their respective roles in the deal. And as a further safety measure, 
have everyone involved sign each pertinent document as evidence that they understand and agree to the terms and conditions. That way, if there is a misunderstanding later, you can always go back to the executed documents. Our second tip is to make sure and use separate agreements with each lease option deal. The two agreements you should use are a lease agreement that details the conditions of the lease and an option agreement that details the conditions of the option. You will learn later in the lesson why it is so important to use the separate agreements. Tip number three is to make sure you understand all local laws as they might apply to lease options. Most states have passed laws that govern certain aspects of how lease option can be performed in the state. You need to make sure you understand these laws and abide by them. Additionally, you should understand the landlord-tenant laws in your area. Since the tenant buyer is considered a renter until they exercise the option, these laws apply to you. Our final tip for this lesson is to define everyone's responsibilities. Make sure each party knows what maintenance and repairs they are responsible for. After all, one of the biggest benefits of a lease option is that you don't have to be a landlord in the traditional sense, which means that you really shouldn't have calls at 3 a.m. asking you to come fix a clogged toilet. Making sure everyone knows what they are responsible for fixing significantly helps reduce calls like that. Wow, great advice, Janet. Doing these things really will make lease options easier. But let's back up just a bit. Let's spend some time talking about what a lease option actually is. Lease options are quite common in the real estate world, though depending upon where you're from, you may not have heard them called lease options. Some people prefer to call them lease purchases, while others prefer rent-to-own properties. There are a smattering of other names circling about, but they all describe essentially the same process, that of a buyer securing the right to purchase a property at a later date in exchange for a small down payment and then monthly payments similar to rent. So the basic outline of a lease option is that an investor obtains control over a property and then leases it out to a tenant in exchange for a small down payment and specific monthly payments to follow over a set period of time. At the same time, the tenant enters into a separate option agreement with the investor that gives the tenant the right to purchase the property at the end of the lease period and typically for a predetermined price. Lease options are considered a cash flow investing strategy because of the many places an investor can make money with them. See, when done correctly, an investor will make money at the very beginning when they first have a tenant sign on and pay the small down payment. They will also make money from the monthly installments that the tenant pays, and then from the end purchase if and when the tenant buyer actually buys the property. So there are three different ways to make money with lease options. That's pretty amazing. You're right, Bob. That's an amazing way to make money as a real estate investor. But unfortunately, lease options are not all sunshine and flowing money. While they are a smart way to invest and have many associated advantages over other investing options, lease options are not without their challenges as well. So let's take some of the time and look at both so that you know exactly what to expect by getting involved with them. Let's look at some of the fantastic advantages lease options present for investors when they are looking to control property. I'm sure you are aware of one of the biggest misconceptions surrounding real estate investing and that's that it takes loads of money, stable job, and good credit to be a successful investor. Well, that's simply not true, and especially not true when you know how to use lease options. Recall that entering into a lease option only requires a small down payment, and when we say small, we mean small. In fact, many times you can get a seller to lease option you a home for as little as one to 3% down, you heard that right, 1% to 3%. That means that if you wanted to buy, say, a $300,000 home, 
you could get into it for as little as $3,000. And as an investor, the less money it takes to control a property, the better. So only needing a little money to start with is one advantage of obtaining property through lease options. A second great advantage aside from the little amount down to control the property is that you actually do have control of the property. But what does that mean to control a property? Essentially controlling the property means that when you take possession of the property, you have every legal right to modify it. So if you need to, you can fix it up to your liking without ever asking the actual owner. Now that's a great advantage, but it's not the best. One of the best from an investor standpoint is that if you structure the deal well enough, you can actually sublease the property and sell your option to purchase to someone else. So you make some good money after only having invested a very small amount. Let's look at an example. Say you're interested in a $300,000 home, but for one reason or another, you just can't get $300,000 to buy it. So you decide to ask the seller if they will lease option it to you. They agree. Now, because you are a good negotiator, you get the seller to agree to only 1% down to start the lease. That's only $3,000. So for only $3,000, you control the home. Well, in your lease agreement, you stipulate that you can sublease the home. And in your option agreement, you stipulate that you can sell your option to another buyer. So as soon as you control the property, you call one of the people on your buyer's list and tell them you have a great deal for them. You explain that they can get into a $320,000 home for only 2% down. They agree, and they give you 2% of the $320,000, which is $6,400. And just like that, you have more than doubled your initial investment. And that doesn't even take into account the money you will make on your monthly rent and the difference in the sales price you agree to versus the sales price your buyer agreed to. Isn't that a great deal? Wow, that is a great deal, Janet. And if I can elaborate, the reason it works so well lies in the general format of the option agreement. See, option agreements are unilateral. That means by entering into the agreement, the seller is obligated to sell you the property if or when you exercise your option to buy. But you are not obligated to buy at any time. You have the option to buy. And as Janet explained, by including the correct clauses in your lease and option agreements, you can lease and sell the property to someone else and make some great money. This process of controlling the property using a lease option, then lease option it to a third party, is called a sandwich lease option. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll cover sandwich lease options in much more detail in the sandwich lease option lesson. I just wanted to mention that because they are so exciting. You're right, Bob. They are exciting. And another thing that makes them so exciting is that by using a lease option to control a property, you can typically beat out other investors who are interested in the same property. The reason for this is because most times you will offer close to the fair market value and then ask the seller to lease it back to you. Whereas most other investors who are looking to buy outright will only offer 70% or so of the fair market value. Obviously, doing this kind of deal requires the seller to have a reason to lease it to you. But we'll discuss how you can determine if the seller is really motivated for lease options later in this lesson. So, these are some of the main benefits to lease options when buying or entering a property. And before we get to the benefits of selling with the lease option, Bob, could you explain some tips for how to protect your lease option if you are buying with one? I sure can. Let me begin by asking, what would happen if the seller holding your lease option dies or otherwise becomes incapacitated? Certainly that isn't a pleasant thought, but it can happen, and therefore should be planned for. Because if such a thing does happen and the property heir doesn't honor your agreement, you could end up losing a fair amount of money. So here are a few quick tips you can use to help protect against such an unfortunate situation. The first tip is to record your option or at least a memorandum of interest. To do this, 
Simply take the option agreement before a notary and have both parties sign it, then have the notary sign it. That way the option can be recorded in the public records, making it public. This can be quite beneficial if there are fulfillment problems. However, recording the option in public records does not create a lien on the property. It only clouds the title. So technically, the seller could sell to another buyer, but if that new buyer does their homework, they will want to know about the cloud and possibly not buy because of it. The second tip you should consider is to have a fully executed deed or quick claim deed held by a title company or an attorney. I realize this next thought is pretty morbid, but if the seller dies before you exercise your option, it's going to be pretty difficult to have them sign the deed over to you. So as a means of protecting yourself, have a deed all signed and held until the closing or the end of the option term, just in case. As another means of protecting yourself, you could consider having an attorney set up a trust that identifies who has rights to what and under what circumstances. Then have them transfer the property into the trust so that all pertinent information is readily available in the event of fulfillment issues. These are some ideas that you can use to protect yourself when buying with a lease option. Take some time to review them and see if one will work well for you. If you don't choose one of these ideas, find something that can protect you in the event of unforeseen circumstances. Also, if you are selling with a lease option, be rather cautious allowing your tenant buyer to record the option or escrow the deed since some states will see such actions as leaning toward a transfer of equitable title. Okay, now that we have discussed those tips, let's move on to the advantages of selling with a lease option. Janet, would you explain those benefits? I certainly will, Bob. Let's go ahead and start with the one advantage that's probably on your mind right now, the money. When a lease option is set up correctly, you, as an investor, can make money all over the place. You get a lump sum up front in the form of a small down payment. Then you get a large lump sum at the end of the lease period if the tenant buyer decides to exercise their option and buy the property. Plus, if you have figured your numbers right, you will make money monthly from the tenant buyers, monthly lease payments. You are literally making money all the time when you sell using a lease option. Another huge advantage to investors is that there is always a market for lease options regardless of what the investing market as a whole is like. No matter how good or how bad things get economically, there will always be credit challenged people or those who can't afford a traditional down payment but want to own a home. So while there are slight market fluctuations in lease options, there are always a large number of buyers who could use the creative way to get into a property that lease options provide. Speaking of the large market of potential buyers, what happens if one of those buyers you have selected to occupy your property just decides to stop paying you? Well, Here's yet another benefit of lease options. All you need to do in that case is a victim. Yep, there's no long and often expensive foreclosure process. You simply file some paperwork with the local county and call the local sheriff to have the tenants evicted. Simple as that. Then you take advantage of the fact that people have been waiting to get into your property, sign a new lease and an option agreement with one of them, and you hardly miss a beat. So why wouldn't you have to foreclose on tenants, you may ask? It's because you never actually closed on the property with them, and you're not considered a lien holder against them. According to the lease agreement, you are simply a landlord expecting monthly payments which the tenant hasn't made. That's one of the reasons it's so important to always use a lease agreement with a separate option agreement. The last major advantage to selling with a lease option that we'll cover is the fact that you can attract more and better tenant buyers by offering a monthly credit toward the purchase of the home for every month the lease payment is on time. Here's an example of how that might work. Say Joe Investor enters into a lease agreement with Nancy Buyer to buy one of Joe's homes for $250,000. Joe requires Nancy to bring 2% of the purchase price or $5,000 
as a down payment. He also stipulates that Nancy pay him $2,000 a month in rent. However, Joe tells Nancy that every month her payment is on time, he will take $500 and apply it towards the purchase price of the property for when she decides to exercise her option to buy. Now assume Nancy stays in the property for two years and always is making her payments on time. In those two years, she will have built $12,000 of credit into the property before she has even purchased it. And it took only $5,000 to get into it anyway. So Nancy gets a great deal and Joe gets a good tenant and they are both happy. We'll come back and talk more about the benefits for buyers in just a second. But that example really illustrates how lease options are beneficial to everyone involved. However, there are some things that, as an investor, you need to watch out for when using lease options. One of the biggest potential challenges arises if the property sits vacant. Granted, it is rare for a lease option property to sit vacant for any length of time, but when one does, the payments on the loan or the lease option used to control it still need to be made, and guess who gets to make them? Yep, you do. At least until you secure a tenant buyer. Again, it is rare for such a situation to arise since the lease options are so appealing to so many people. But in the event you do have an empty property, it can pose potential financial challenges. You can also have challenges if you get a bad tenant buyer. We already discussed that if they simply don't pay, then it's easy to get rid of them if the agreements have been created correctly. But if they're sloppy or just simply trash the property and then don't exercise their option to buy, then you may be left with a property that needs repairs and doesn't have a tenant buyer. Now the upside to that is the fact that you have their initial down payment to help cover the cost of the needed repairs. But having the money doesn't always mitigate the headache of having to do unexpected repairs. Here is another challenge to selling with a lease option, and it has to do with changes in market conditions. The best way to explain this challenge is through an example. So let's assume that you have a home and you get a tenant buyer in it that has agreed to a two-year lease with an option to buy at the end of the two years. You've set the purchase price of the home to be $250,000 at the end of the two-year period. Well, during those two years, you have no control over what will happen in the local home market. It might increase significantly or it might totally die off. If it decreases, then your tenant buyer might not choose to exercise the option since they can get a similar home to yours for cheaper than what they've agreed to in the option agreement. Having a tenant leave without exercising their option isn't necessarily a bad thing. We'll come back and talk about that a little bit later in the lesson. But if market value increases and at the end of the option agreement, properties like yours are selling for 300,000, then you miss out on some potential profit. And that's always a bummer. But you'll still be making money, not quite as much as you could have. The final challenge of selling with lease option is the fact that some states regulate lease options rather aggressively, and state laws can change frequently and with very little or no media coverage. Therefore, it becomes your responsibility to understand how lease options are viewed in your area, the laws that govern them, and when those laws get changed. Now, I can tell you that most common changes to the laws governing lease options have to do with how long the lease can be in place the phraseology in the agreements, and the various disclosures the tenant buyer is required to sign. So do yourself a favor and try to keep up on any changes to the laws in your area so that you don't get stuck with fees for violating them. Okay, so there are not really that many challenges to selling with a lease option. That's one of the reasons why they are so popular with investors. But what about buyers? Bob? Can you explain a little bit about the benefits and the challenges buyers face when getting into a property using a lease option? Thanks, Janet. I sure can. There are a number of advantages for tenant buyers when they use a lease option to control a property. One of the first and most notable is the small amount of money it takes to get into a property. As we have discussed, there are plenty of sellers who will get a tenant buyer into their property with only 1 to 3% down. 
But not only can tenant buyers get in for very little, but they can have the chance to live in the property, experience the area, and decide if they like it enough to purchase it. Under what other situation can you live in a property for up to a couple of years before you decide if you want to buy it? And there is no one that can buy the property from under them as long as they keep making their payments. Lease options also help people with credit or down payment problems get into a property. These people can save for a down payment and build equity faster than they can in any other situation while they live in the home. But even with so many benefits, lease options are not without their challenges for tenant buyers as well. Probably the biggest challenge facing tenant buyers is laziness. Think about it. One of the reasons they may have opted for a lease option as opposed to traditional buying is that they have either bad credit or no money down. Well, if during the course of the lease option they do nothing to remedy their problem, then at the end of the lease agreement they will not be able to exercise their option. Granted, they may be able to negotiate with the owner to renew the lease and option agreements, but they will probably require another down payment and possibly an adjustment to the monthly rent amount at the end of the purchase price. So tenant buyers with credit and down payment issues need to be proactive to remedy those issues during the lease period, or they won't be able to really take advantage of the financial benefits of a lease option. Similarly, if the tenant buyer doesn't keep their payments current, they will not be foreclosed upon. They can get evicted, and eviction is a much faster process than foreclosure, so the tenant buyer in arrears doesn't have as much time to remedy the payment situation or to find a new place to live in the event that they cannot get back on track with their payments. Also, if they do get evicted, they could forfeit any money paid on the property, so they may have to start from ground zero again. So as you can see, there are many benefits and challenges when it comes to working with lease options. Take some time and review them so you can better determine if this is a good investment technique for you. As a note, don't put undue focus on the challenges lease options present, because they really are a great way to invest. But look at the pros and cons subjectively, as well as your personal strengths and weaknesses, and decide if this is a good fit for you. The remainder of this lesson will teach you concepts and practices that will reduce the risks associated with lease options. Okay, thanks Bob. That's great information. Let's now move on to discuss exactly how to structure a lease and an option agreement. Before we start talking about the agreement specifically, let me remind you that lease options are created by a seller and a tenant buyer signing two agreements. The first is the lease agreement, and the second, the option agreement. Since they are separate agreements, we will discuss them separately beginning with the lease agreement. The lease agreement can be just a traditional lease agreement that you can get online or through a real estate agent in your area. If you prefer to get online, you can go to your favorite search engine and enter your state, followed by lease agreement, and find some options. You want to make sure you use your state in the search criteria so you get a more state-specific agreement. Then, when you have one you like, take some time to read it over closely and even consider having an attorney look at it to make sure it conforms to all current state laws. For a lease option, the lease agreement functions just like it would were you using it for a traditional lease situation, except there may be a few more clauses in it. Some of the most important items the lease agreement details are the length of the lease, the monthly rent amount, the end date for the lease, and any late fees that may be imposed as well as when they will take effect. Most generic lease agreements have these basic items already included in them. However, let's discuss some clauses that you should look for and may even have to add to your agreement. Your agreement should have a description of the security deposit as well as the terms and conditions that would make the deposit refunded or reduced. Most times the security deposit is non-refundable, but under certain circumstances you may allow the tenant buyer to get all or part of it back. 
you can determine exactly what qualifies a person for a refund, but be rather strict since that deposit is part of your profit if the tenant buyer decides to skip out on you. The lease agreement should also specify who is responsible for what repairs and up to what amount. And since this isn't entirely a typical lease situation, you want to make the tenant buyers responsible for a bit more when it comes to repairs. So for example, you may choose to have the tenant buyer responsible for any and all repairs that cost less than $500. Setting an amount such as this will help encourage the tenant buyer to take care of the property in the event they forget that they're essentially buying it from you. Your lease agreement should also require that the tenant buyer maintain renter's insurance on the property. Doing so is sort of a double benefit for you. The first benefit is, of course, the fact that the property is insured, but the second is a bit more obscure. It is that by having the tenant buyer maintain renter's insurance can make a stronger case against an equitable mortgage or equitable title. We'll discuss more about what equitable title is, how it may come about, and how to avoid it later in this lesson. But know for now that having the tenant buyer get and maintain renter's insurance can help avoid it. So these are some of the clauses you should look for in your lease agreement. But there are some ways to modify or specify these clauses to make the agreement even stronger or more beneficial for you. Bob, would you mind giving some tips on exactly what to change to make a super strong lease agreement? I'd be glad to. The first thing is, as part of the renter's insurance clause, you should state clearly that the agreement the tenant buyer is agreeing to is a lease agreement not a mortgage. Now I realize that it may seem a bit silly to have to include on a lease agreement a statement saying that it is a lease agreement, but having such a statement can be important if equitable title becomes an issue. Additionally, you don't want to refer to the option agreement or to any option considerations or credits in the lease agreement. Janet and I will explain how option credits work a bit later, but for now, please understand that your lease agreement should not mention anything about them or the option agreement. The reason you want to avoid talking about the option is because it could, albeit it's a long shot, but it could be misconstrued in a court as a mortgage and not a lease, and you don't want that to happen. So be safe and don't mention anything about the option in the lease agreement. Another tip to consider is specifying that the lease term be somewhere between six months to two years long. Now, I know six months to two years seems like a pretty wide time spread, but it is set up that way because some states have laws that are very particular about lease options and equitable title. So for some states, you should keep your lease less than six months, and for those that don't control lease options so strictly, you may consider having the lease extend at least two years in order to better take advantage of the monthly cash flow and have the flexibility to adjust rent amounts to changing market conditions if need be. Thanks, Bob. Those are some excellent tips to consider. Now let's move on to talk about the option agreement. The option agreement is the one that specifies how and when the tenant buyer can exercise their option and actually purchase the property. It's obviously a rather important document and one that requires some very specific terms and conditions explained in it. One of the main things the option agreement should clearly state is an expiration date. The expiration date signals the end of the lease option agreement where, if the option is not exercised or renewed, it becomes null and void. Aside from the option expiration date, you should include whether or not you will allow the tenant buyer to renew their agreement if they decide not to buy at that time. Either way, you need to make it very clear in the agreement what the terms are for renewal or make it clear that renewing the lease is not an option. Another big thing that needs to be made clear in the option agreement regards the purchase price. Now, you don't actually have to settle on a purchase price right up front. You can simply state that the purchase price will be based on the fair market value of the property at the expiration of the options agreement. If you choose to go this route, you also need to explain how the fair market value will be determined at that time. If you choose to include the purchase price in the option agreement, 
You just need to explain it as the future purchase price due at the expiration of the option agreement should the tenant buyer choose to purchase. If you allow option considerations or credits, they should be explained in the option agreement along with the amounts of each, if you give them. But don't only say how much. Go a step further in protecting yourself and explain how to qualify for the credit, how the money will be held until it is released, who will hold it. I recommend you use an escrow company. Who has access to it and under what circumstances can it be accessed? I realize that some of this sounds like it might be pretty technical or at least unfamiliar. So you can also have an attorney help you set everything up and write the contract. Now, if there is a portion of the consideration that you allow to be refunded, then you also need to specify how a person qualifies for the refund and how much is available to be refunded. Keep in mind that you don't have to offer any refunds at all, but if you do, make sure your agreement is very clear on exactly what you will and won't do and under what circumstances. Finally, you should include a statement that the property title will not be transferred into the tenant buyer's name until the property closes. It seems fairly obvious that you wouldn't transfer the title until the closing, but like I mentioned in the tips for success, it's always good to have everything in writing. In addition to the things Janet just mentioned, there are some contract mechanics that, while they don't necessarily need to be clauses in your agreements, should be thoughtfully considered all the same. Now there are a couple of the mechanics I'll talk about that Janet already mentioned and recommended including as clauses in the agreement. And the reason I repeat them is because they are all important enough to bear repeating, or there is a way of thinking about them that needs to be explained before the idea gets put into the clause. So with that, let me introduce the first mechanical item. Make sure to end the lease term at the same time as the option term. Recall that the option agreement is unilateral, therefore the seller is required to sell to the person named on the contract, but only if that person wants to buy. Because of that unilateral relationship, you should always have the lease term end at the same time the option is due and vice versa. That way if the tenant buyer doesn't buy, you can either renegotiate the lease or find a new tenant buyer, there is no overlap to account for. Also, in terms of the lease, it is not in your best interest to allow your tenant buyer to sublet and assign your option agreement. Allowing subleases and assignments just limits the control you have over the deal. See, by subletting, you may not know who is directly responsible for making payment or who is going to be the ultimate buyer if they choose to exercise the option. Now, does it matter that you don't know the end tenant buyer? No, not really, as long as the tenant buyer you signed the agreement with continues to pay. But you do lose just a little control over the property by allowing subletting, so I don't recommend it. I know that Janet talked about including the option price in the option agreement, but is it best to lock in a price now and hope that the market doesn't surpass that price? Or do you gamble on the market continuing to increase in value and use the fair market price at the time of sale? Well, to help you determine that, simply put out your crystal ball that shows you the future and see which will be best. Okay, so maybe the crystal ball technique isn't the most feasible. So let's discuss some slightly more practical ways you can consider to help you decide how to include the purchase price in an option agreement. The first is that you can lock in the purchase price in the option agreement. This is the most beneficial if you think housing prices might drop during the option period, or if you need to ensure a specific profit from the sale of the property. If you want to lock in a purchase price, you should do some investigative work in your target market to see what the appreciation trends have been over the last 10 years or so and use the average as a guide in determining your option price. On the other hand, if you think prices might increase significantly during the option period, then you can state in the option agreement that the purchase price will be based on the fair market value of the property at the time the option is exercised. If you choose to use this option, 
then make sure you include some specific information about how the fair market value will be determined and then how the actual purchase price will be established based on that fair market value. Another mechanical issue involved with lease options is to just make sure that the property title stays in the seller's name until closing. Typically, you will be the seller. So just keep the title under your name throughout the duration of the lease and option agreement and only allow it to change at the closing. This way, there will be no confusion as to who really owns the property. But it's also the only way to ensure you will still gain the tax benefits of owning the property. Also, since your name or the business name should stay on the title, it is essential that you continue paying the mortgage and taxes on the property. Even though the tenant buyer is paying enough to cover the mortgage and the taxes, do not allow them to make payments directly to a lender or the government. You can avoid a lot of potential equitable title issues by doing this. Another mechanical item for the lease agreement is to always require a security deposit and call it a security deposit. Don't call a down payment or anything else that would denote the transaction is a sale. The amount you require should be a reasonable amount for that area and should follow standard landlord-tenant laws concerning its refund should the tenant buyer move out before the end of the lease agreement. If the tenant buyer does move out, then you can use the security deposit for any necessary repairs and speaking of repairs, it is a good idea to include in your lease agreement information about who is responsible for what repairs during the lease. Don't just assume the tenant buyer will fix anything that comes up, especially if they are stuck thinking they are just renters. Specifically state that they are responsible for repairs that cost under a certain amount and that if the repairs are more expensive than that amount, you will take care of them. Generally, setting a $500 limit is a good choice since that places all the small daily repairs under the tenant buyer's responsibility and lets you get away from being a traditional landlord. Now, there's been quite a bit of talk about equitable title and things that can be done to avoid it. But what is it really, and how does it apply to you in a lease option scenario? I can answer those questions, Bob. Equitable title is the interest held by one who has agreed to purchase, but who has not yet closed the transaction, or an ownership interest held by one who does not have legal title to a property, but has the right to receive legal title upon performance of an obligation. That's just a great legal jargon, but let me translate it. Essentially, equitable title means that a seller is offering ownership of a property, but without the title to the property transferring to the buyer until an obligation is fulfilled. Generally, the obligation is a financial one, but it doesn't need to be. Well, this sounds like an awful lot like a mortgage to me, and when you look at them both, mortgages and equitable titles are very similar. And if you're not careful, your lease option can be viewed as a transfer of equitable title, and that is bad, since it could require you to pay your underlying mortgage in full or lose ownership of the property. But how does equitable title even become an issue? It will either come up because of the lender holding your mortgage or through the tenant buyer taking you to court over a disagreement in the lease and or option agreement. About the only way it will come up by way of your lender is if you allow the tenant buyer to make a payment directly to the lender. See, they might notice the name on the payment is different than that on their records and begin asking why. Now, most lenders have what is called a due on sale clause built into their loan agreements. The due on sale clause states that if you are found violating the loan terms, then the lender can immediately call the remainder of the loan due or foreclose. So if in their investigation they determine you have sold the property, that triggers the due on sale clause. And if your tenant buyer is not in a position to exercise the option and buy, well, you can see how that could cause some problems. The other situation is if the tenant buyer feels jaded enough for some reason or another, that they feel the only way to settle their issue is in court and they sue you. 
While the lawsuit itself won't directly lead to an equitable title issue, there may be enough information given in the proceedings as to convince a judge that the transaction is better classified as a sale, not a lease agreement. That's the main reason to always, always use a separate lease and option agreement. Throughout the lesson, we've mentioned several ways to avoid equitable title, but let me review them all right here, just so that you can see them all together. There are six things you can do. They are, first, make certain you use two distinctly separate agreements, one for the lease and another for the option. Second, take the time to familiarize yourself with how your state views lease options and lease terms. Then, modify your lease and option agreements accordingly. For example, if your state has a tendency to classify lease options longer than one year as sales transactions, make sure that your lease and option periods are less than a year, but also with an option to renew if the tenant buyer needs to. Third, be wary of the language you use in your agreements. For example, everything in the lease talks about only the lease. There is no mention of the option. Also, the tenant is just a landlord, not a tenant buyer, and you are just a landlord, not a landlord seller. And you collect a security deposit, not a down payment. Using the correct language in the agreement is very important. The fourth thing you can do to help avoid equitable title is to keep the title in your name until the option has been exercised and recorded. Fifth. Continue paying the mortgage, property taxes, and insurance. Many times, if there is any question of equitable title, the decision comes down to who is paying the taxes and insurance on the property. So if your name has been listed as the payee, chances are that you will not receive an equitable title ruling. Sixth and finally, make sure everything is in writing and the tenant buyer understands very clearly what they are agreeing to when they sign. Don't try to hide anything you think the buyer might disagree with. Instead, make everything very clear. Miscommunication is the root of many of the problems investors face. So be sure and communicate clearly. Thanks, Janet. That's some great information. Now, let's move on to talk more about option considerations and credits. Both these items have been mentioned in the lesson, but we haven't yet discussed them sufficiently. Hopefully by now you realize that lease options can be very beneficial for a buyer tenant for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is that the tenant buyer can have time to live in the property and save up a down payment before actually purchasing it. But there will be some who, despite their best efforts, just won't be able to save up a good down payment. However, if you decide to allow option considerations and credits, then the tenant buyers can then make their regular monthly payments and, while doing so, accrue a down payment even while you are making money on the property. But my question is, why would you allow credits? I mean, it's great to be altruistic, but does it benefit you or help you make more money? Actually, it does. If you offer great terms on your lease option, there will be more people interested in the properties you have available. And if there are more people interested, there is a better selection and a better chance you will get good tenant buyers. And you can start making money on the property faster. Also, when you help someone get into a good situation, when you are ready to do another lease option, those people you helped can often give you some great referrals. So how does it all work? There are three ways you can help. By allowing an upfront consideration, by offering monthly credits, or for those of you who are truly philanthropic, by offering both. Whichever you choose, the money set aside should be a non-refundable and applicable only if the tenant buyer exercises their option to buy. That way, if they don't buy, you don't owe them anything. So let's look at each option a little closer so you can determine if you want to offer any one of them. An option consideration is just a fancy name for a down payment. As we have discussed, you don't want to call it a down payment. The amount you require for the consideration can be applied to the end purchase price of the property, thus helping the tenant buyer reduce that final price. In most cases, 
the option consideration is only $3,000 to $5,000 or three months of payments. However, you can ask as much as 5% of the purchase price. Check with your state to see if they have any restrictions on what can be charged for the consideration and then check general market trends in your area to know what is generally accepted. A second way to help your tenant buyer is to offer them monthly credits toward the property purchase price. It is common to allow 20% of the monthly rent as credit towards the final purchase, but make sure you don't allow more than 50% of your monthly cash flow as credit. Also, make sure there is some incentive for the tenant buyer. For example, only give the credit for months that they pay on time or by a certain day of the month. If you choose to allow the option consideration to go toward the final purchase price and you offer monthly credits, then just require a little less than you normally would up front and allow a little less per month than you normally would. That way you can still maintain a strong profit margin but help your tenant buyer at the same time. Whichever way you choose to go, if you choose to offer credits, you need to make sure what you are offering is very clear in your option agreement. State specifically how much will be applied to the purchase and that the money will only be released at closing. You may even consider having an attorney drop the agreement or at least review one you create. Excellent. Well, now that hypothetically you have solid lease and option agreements, let's take a moment to discuss how the deal will finish. Essentially, there are only three ways the lease option can end. Either the tenant buyer exercises their option before the expiration date, they buy at or around the expiration date, or they don't buy at all. And get this. All three options are beneficial to you if you took the time to set everything up correctly. Let's look at them. Notice that we haven't mentioned anything about requiring the tenant buyer to wait until the end of the lease option period to exercise their option. That's because it really doesn't matter if they buy after one month or after two years. Either way, you come out on top. So if by chance the tenant buyer chooses to exercise their option before it expires, sure, you miss out on the monthly cash flow, but you get a higher profit amount quicker and you can then go to get another property and lease option. And you are probably selling the property for more than the current market value. Now it's rare for a tenant buyer to exercise their option prior to its expiration because most times they need as much time as they can to rebuild their credit or they need time to save for a down payment or they simply just forget that they can buy before that time. The second possibility is that the tenant buyer buys at the end of the option term. Well, this is obviously beneficial for you since you benefited from the monthly cash flow for an extended period and you make money on the sales price. So you see great profit through the whole deal. The third option is quite a bit more interesting. Many people think that if the tenant buyer doesn't exercise their option and simply lets it expire, that it's a bad thing. Well, it's really not. In fact, it may turn out to be a very, very good thing for you. See, when the option expires, the tenant buyer has two options, either renew the lease and option, or move out. Either way, you get to create a new lease agreement and a new option agreement, and when you create new agreements, you can raise the final purchase price, raise the monthly rent amount, or potentially both, and end up making even more money than you initially anticipated. On the other hand, if you decide you were done with the property, then you can sell it outright and move on to another. Or, if you need a larger sum than a new option consideration could account for, refinance the property and pull the equity you have in it out. If you do this, just make sure your new monthly rent is in line with the new mortgage amount. So with these three options, and when done correctly, a lease option will make you some great money regardless if the tenant buyer buys or not. Excellent information, Janet. Up to this point in the lesson, you have learned a lot about how to create and end lease options. 
and all of that is great. But it doesn't really matter much if you don't have any property to work with or tenant buyers to work with. So let's go ahead and spend some time discussing marketing as it relates to lease options. You should know a little bit about real estate marketing in general from the Real Estate Basics lessons, but we will focus specifically on lease options. There are three main goals you will market for when doing lease options. To get referrals, to get sellers, and to get tenant buyers. Each of them has a slightly different marketing method that is most effective, so we'll discuss them each in turn. But before we get into the marketing, recall that it is extremely important for you to evaluate your marketing plan and budget to see what you can afford and to test various marketing strategies to see what works best in your area. That's quite a bit to cover, so let's jump right into it. Your biggest goal when it comes to marketing is to be able to create a solid list of buyers and sellers. By having such a list, you won't need to spend as much time looking for either a buyer or seller for each deal. You'll already have a solid list of ones to turn to. Now, it will take some time to establish this kind of list, but once you have it, you'll really be able to start working smarter, not harder. Imagine how nice it will be to have a list of people calling you instead of you trying to find them. So let's get to it. Now you may be asking yourself, which is the best all around marketing technique? Well, there really isn't one that is universal. Each technique will get slightly different results depending on where you are. However, there are a couple that have been proven to be beneficial in almost every area, and they are advertising through classified ads as well as through postcards. Janet, will you explain how classified ads can work? I'd be delighted. The first thing to note with classified ads is that putting them in local newspapers is better than posting them in more major papers. There are two reasons for this. The first is price. Local papers generally won't charge as much as leading major papers that get a significantly wider distribution. And since you will need to post ads regularly, the cost of major papers just might not be worth it, especially if you consider the second reason local papers are better and that is that there is just too much in many of the major papers. Certainly, there are more readers of the major papers, but there are also a lot more ad contributors. So you could generally need to pay extra fees to draw attention to your ads for them to be effective. That combined with the higher starting price compared to the frequency you will need to list an ad makes major newspapers generally less desirable than local ones. But still, Give the major papers a call and find out how much they do charge and ask them if they give any discounts for ongoing ads and if they know what day of the week their real estate section gets read most. In most cases, they get the most readers on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, which days also tend to correspond to the paper's most expensive days to run an ad. Isn't that convenient? So take a good look at your budget and see if you have the funds available to work with classified ads either in the local papers or major ones. If you don't have the funds available for paid classifieds right now, then feel free to start with freebie newspapers. Don't let the name deceive you. With freebie papers, the paper is free, but not the advertising space. They will still charge for you to place ads, but they will almost always give discounts for ongoing ads or ads that appear in multiple sections. Thrifty Nickel, Penny Power, Penny Pincher, Penny Saver, and Green Sheet are some of the more common examples of freebie papers. Most of these newspapers are also available online, so consider taking advantage of that additional exposure with your ads. But certainly don't limit yourself to just printed classifieds. With the huge number of people that read their paper online and who shop online, Placing online classifieds has become very effective almost universally. There are a number of sites you can use to place online classifieds. Some allow you to post an ad for free, while others do charge a fee. Now, those that are free are probably free for a reason. They may not get much traffic and therefore not many readers. But let me ask, does that matter? Absolutely not. They are free. So who cares if in the next year you only get one response from a free listing? It's still free. So evaluate both the free and pay sites and submit ads to all the free ones and some of those that charge fees that you will think will best suit your needs and budget. 
If you don't know of any online classifieds, simply go to your favorite search engine and enter online classifieds and you will see a huge number to sift through. And since the internet is so vast, don't limit yourself to just online classifieds. Check out other real estate oriented sites and see what they offer in terms of advertising. Some will charge monthly fees, others might allow you to advertise for free or in the form of forums and other posts to the site. If you can't recall any real estate sites, just go back to your trusty search engine and enter real estate listing services, realtor websites, real estate blogs, real estate forums, or real estate networking, and you are bound to have literally millions to choose from. Regardless of where you do your advertising, the point is to get your information in front of as many sellers, buyers, or people who can give you referrals as possible. So spread your ads out as much as possible. That's great information, Bob. And let's talk about what to put in the ads for a minute so that the ads placed can be strong ones that attract attention. The first thing to think about is getting words in the ads that will catch your target audience's attention. But in order to do that, you need to know your target audience and who it is. Well, for referrals, you mostly want to focus on people who are constantly involved in real estate, such as agents, lenders, and landlords. And since you are looking for referrals, the language you use in the ad should be centered on the problem the person or a client of theirs is having that you can solve. For example, you could use the phrases like home, not selling, out of state owner, need help making payments, or any of the others listed here. You also want to mention the fact that you can help remedy the negative situation you mentioned in the ad. You might consider saying something like, home not selling, we can help, we pay top dollar for homes. Or another example might be, out of state owner, let us buy your home and relieve your stress. The last thing to include in your ad is a call to action. It may seem silly to tell someone to contact you if they're interested, but your response rate will be higher if you do tell people than if you don't. Some examples of a call to action include, call today for more information, or don't waste any more time and money, call today, or any of the others listed here. You may have noticed that the examples given are fairly short. Well, there are two reasons for that. First, is that you are paying for the space you use, so it is in your best interest to be short and concise while still making your point clear. The second reason to keep them short is because people simply won't take much time to read the ad. Think about when you browse the classifieds. Do you take time to read every single ad, or do you skim and only read those that catch your attention? Most people just skim, and most of the people who see your ad will just be skimming. So keep the ad short, but make sure to make your point and include a call to action. Also, make sure you have realistic expectations with your ads. Chances are you won't hit a home run with your first ad. Instead, you should run a few and test which ones are performing best. Then build on those that are working to get them to work better. This process is called split testing, and it is essential to help you create the best performing ad you possibly can. To split test your ads, simply create a couple and get them out in the classifieds. Make sure they have similar distribution and let them run for a month or two. During that time, record how many responses you get from each ad individually. At the end of the month or two, take the one that performed best and make one slight change to it and let the new ad and the old one run together for a month or so and modify the one that gets the best response. You want to make sure and change only one aspect of the ad or one phrase in the ad at a time. If you change more than that and the new ad does better or worse, you won't know what part that you changed that made the difference. So make sure that you only change one part at a time for testing. Test for several months and after a little while, you will have a consistently performing ad to use. Another way that is proven to get fairly consistent results is to send postcards to people who you think might be able to provide referrals. 
you should follow the same guidelines in terms of your target market and text that you had used with the classified ads with one exception. With a postcard, you have two sides to work with, not just one. And so you should definitely take advantage of both sides of the card. So let's talk about how to use each side. For clarity, I will refer to the side that has the address as the back of the card and the side that is not addressed as the front of the card. As I just mentioned, on the front of the card, you can use similar text that you used in your classified ads. You will have about the same amount of room to work with, and you will want to send the same message, so that should be pretty easy. You can also choose to place a nice picture on the front of the card, particularly if you're having a printing company print them for you. If you choose to use a picture, make sure it is one that applies to the message on the card and that it doesn't cover or blend into the text that you have written. For example, here are two postcards. The top one has been done well. You can see the text clearly since the image doesn't overlap or blend in with it, and that the picture is well suited for the message. But with the second card, notice how it is hard to read the text because of the picture, and this picture doesn't really do much to support the text. This would be considered an ineffective card. If you are going to have printed cards, try to make them look like the top example. Now, if you are getting a print company to print up your cards, many times they will have images and even image suggestions for you. But if not, then you can go on these excellent sites and download some that you like. Here are some of the best inexpensive image sites. www.istockphoto.com www.sxc.hu or www.photolia.com. The images on these sites are not free, but you can get most of them for only a dollar or two, and they are very high quality images. If you would like, take some time now to browse the sites listed. When you are ready, simply click Next to continue the lesson. Now let's talk about the back of the card. Obviously, the back will have the address and probably your return address. So you are a little more limited in terms of the available space on the side, but you should still include a short message. Some of the things you could include in the back are, keep this card for further reference, or contact us now to see how we can help you, or give this card to someone who may need our help. Try a few out and see if the message you use on the back of the card changes your response rate. It is important to have something on the back, especially since most people tend to throw out postcards they don't recognize, and you have no control over what side the receiver sees when they pull the card out of the mailbox. So by having a short message on the back, you have a better chance of getting their attention at least long enough for them to turn the card over and read the other side. We have mentioned that you can choose to have a print company print up your cards, and that's a great option. But if your marketing budget doesn't allow for the cost of printing cards, then you can also write them by hand. In fact, in some markets, a handwritten card is more effective than a printed one. If you are interested in creating the cards by hand, then you can go to your local office supply store and they should have some blank postcards or blank index cards you can get for cheap. Then just get a high quality black or blue pen and start writing. Now, if you're like me, you may not have good enough handwriting to create a legible card, much less a good professional looking one. Also, you may not have the time required to sit down and write out a bunch of cards. So if you are in either of these situations, you can advertise for some local high school or college students to write them for you at a set rate per card. This can be a great way to get a good looking handwritten card without investing a lot of time and only a little money. On the other hand, if your budget allows for it and you prefer the look of a professionally printed card, then you can go to your favorite search engine and enter postcard services or postcard printers and find a number of great companies to choose from. Also, as you are looking at various companies' prices for postcards, Take an extra second or two to see their prices on flyers and brochures and business cards. By printing some of these, you can have something physical to give the potential referrals you meet in your day-to-day -day activities. We will discuss more about these kinds of direct marketing in future marketing-specific lessons.
All right. That was some great information about how to market to find referrals. Now let's move on to talking about how to market to find sellers. But before we get started, let me pose a question to you. Do you really have to market to find sellers? Think about that for a second. Do you really need to market to find sellers? You may be surprised, but the answer is no. You don't need to market to find sellers. And now that you think about it for a second, that makes sense because after all, there are hundreds of properties for sale and in a distressed condition in your target area, right? I'm sure that there are, but that isn't what I'm referring to. Instead, I wanted to point out that if you have a good enough referral system in place, you will have both buyers and sellers contacting you for your services. So take some time to get a good referral system in place, but don't neglect to market specifically for sellers until you can rely on referrals. Also, marketing to sellers can be very inexpensive. So if your budget is fairly small, then you can just call on ads that use language motivated sellers generally use. Look for motivated sellers in classifieds, both online and in papers, and on real estate websites and blogs, through real estate agents, by driving through neighborhoods, and of course, by simply talking to as many people as you can. As you browse through ads looking for sellers, keep an eye out for the keywords listed here as they generally lead to motivated sellers. Notice that one of the phrases is possible lease option. If you are looking to enter a deal using a lease option, then sublease it. You should look specifically for this phrase or others that indicate monthly payments or renting to own. Be aware that when you call on these, some of the people you talk to will be other investors, and that's not a bad thing. Take a minute with the other investors to talk to them and try to build a relationship with them so that you can get referrals and or tips from them. Regardless how you find out about the seller, you need to get in contact with them. Phoning them is typically your best option. When you get a hold of the seller, your goal is to determine their level of motivation. Listed here are seven questions you should generally try to get the seller to answer. These questions will help you know if doing a lease option to enter the property is possible with the seller. If it seems like a lease option is possible and they properly are motivated, then go through the evaluation process. Determine a purchase price that allows for good end profit and monthly cash flow and present them with an offer. You have some great marketing information at this point, and with what you have, you could be very successful with lease options. But let me go one step further with you to help ensure that success and talk about marketing to find good tenant buyers for your lease options. Your goal when marketing for buyers is to create a buyer's list. A buyer's list for lease options is a list of people who are looking to buy a home using some sort of financing that you offer. Most of these potential buyers have specific criteria they are looking for. So the more information you can get for them, the more deals you will be able to do since you will be better equipped to match homes to buyers. So the question becomes, how do you create a buyer's list? Obviously through your referrals, you will get some buyers. But as you are advertising in classifieds for sellers, you can also drop in ads for buyers. Use the same tactics to find buyers as you would to find sellers, but just change the phrases a bit. Here are some of the phrases you could use to find buyers. Here are some examples of how you might phrase ads for buyers. Why rent when you can rent to own? We offer many options to get you into a home with little money down. Bad credit, okay. Call today for more information. Or another option is, Stop paying your landlord's mortgage and start paying your own. We can help. Contact us today to find out how. Here are a couple others for you to consider. In just a minute, we will talk about how to screen buyers to see if they are good candidates for you to work with or if they meet your investing criteria. But before we get to that, I want to explain that some of the people who will call will not fit those criteria. But that doesn't mean that they are totally worthless to you. Take a minute and talk to them and see if they know people who are more in line with your buyer criteria. In fact, 
You can even consider offering them a referral fee if they send you someone who meets your criteria and whom you do a deal with. Generally, the amount you offer for a referral should be $100 to $500. One key to remember as you build your buyers list is to always try and track how the contact found out about you. That way, you can go back through your marketing efforts at the end of the month and see exactly which ones are being most productive for you. You should also split test your buyer's ads the same way you would with your seller's ads. Now think of how nice it will be when you have a bunch of people calling you to get into one of your properties. That's exciting. But unfortunately, you simply won't be able to help each person that calls. There has to be some criteria you use to help make sure you will work with quality tenant buyers so as to maximize your profits. So as people call in, try to get them to answer as many of these nine questions as possible to see if they could be good to work with. The answers they provide to these questions will help you understand their needs and if they meet your investing criteria. But what are your investing criteria? Janet, would you explain that for us? I sure will. In most cases, your ideal candidate has been denied conventional financing or they are simply accustomed to renting and don't feel comfortable venturing out to find financing for a purchase. They may know that they either have a low credit score or no credit history at all. They may have a high debt to income ratio or only a small down payment, any one of which that would disqualify them from obtaining traditional financing. Also, many of the people you work with won't mind fixing or will even want to fix up a property while they work towards increasing their credit or down payment or just paying off some of their debt. Since you are identifying what makes a good tenant buyer, then it makes sense that you should also identify what generally makes a good seller. Most of the ideal lease option sellers you will work with have several of the same motivating factors. Some of these factors could be that the seller is currently, or soon will be, paying two mortgages. It could be that the property is simply old with a lot of deferred maintenance that the owner doesn't want to take care of. If the property does need repairs, it is possible that the owner simply doesn't have the money to perform those repairs. Also, some owners that qualify as good sellers just don't immediately need the money from a sale, but would like to continue having the tax benefits of owning the property. Another situation common to ideal sellers is that they are moving far from the property and they don't want the hassle of hiring someone to show it while they are gone or having to try and rush a sale thus making a lease option perfect for them. Now, keep in mind that these are just some of the more common reasons why a seller might be good for a lease option. But don't limit yourself to these kinds of sellers because anyone who has equity in their home and has a desire to sell it can be a potential lease option candidate. Wow, there's been a lot of information provided for you in this lesson. Hopefully you have a great understanding of how flexible and beneficial lease options can be and how they can really be a great money-making option in virtually any market. But aside from their many advantages, you should also be able to identify some of the challenges you may face by working with lease options. To help eliminate some of these challenges, Janet and I have outlined some of the most effective marketing techniques you can use to find both buyers and sellers. Similarly, we have discussed some of the most common attributes ideal buyers and sellers have so you can keep an eye out for those as your marketing begins to work for you. If as you review your notes, you still have some questions, please feel free to watch this lesson as many times as you wish. You have learned some excellent information in this lesson. And knowing is good, but benefiting from that knowledge is much better. So here are some things you can start doing now to put into practice the information you have gained. The first is to evaluate lease options and decide if they are appealing to you in your current situation. Then find at least two different lease and option agreements and look over them to see how they have been constructed compared to the things you have learned in this lesson. Also, Take some time to familiarize yourself with the landlord-tenant laws in your state. 
At the same time you are gathering information about the laws in your state, also take the time to get information about the average rental deposit, monthly rent amount, and market values for homes in your target area. Once you have familiarized yourself with your target area, decide on a marketing technique and implement it to start creating a buyer and seller's list. Finally, as you find properties that you are interested in lease optioning, present at least five written offers on properties. Keep in mind that you can enter a property using a lease option as well, so don't let your ability to obtain finance and keep you from making those offers and getting started making money. This completes this lesson on lease options. Now it's up to you to go out and put your new knowledge to work for you. Keep in mind the reasons you began learning about real estate and work toward achieving those dreams.